Hello everyone, this is Bill Roach, and this is another episode going out to how many? The entire Fruited Plain. I want to thank you again for coming here as we are going to discuss several exciting things. But before we do, I want to tell you about a few things that went on with us this weekend. In particular, we went to the North Carolina State Fair, which if you have never been to the North Carolina State Fair, let's just say the people who make the videos, people of Walmart, have a new crew that they can film. In fact, they point to them and they say, let's have people of the State Fair, and they collect different aspects of them. And one of the crazy, probably once-in-a-lifetime things that I've ever seen is we had this little hubbub that came about where this lady was pushing a stroller into the fair. And interestingly enough, she started to get angry and she was asked to leave. In fact, they escorted her beyond the premises. And I wonder why would they do such a thing? Well, come to find out, she was actually trying to sneak a pet baby monkey. Yes, you heard me right. A pet baby monkey into the North Carolina State Fair. That is humanity at its finest and fairest. You can't ask for more. But again, what we need you to do here today is I have been trying to put these together on a variety of topics, but I need your help. I need you to please do me one favor as you keep listening to this. Can you go down and please subscribe to this channel and like this channel? Feel free to comment too because that helps me know what you're looking for and to bring different ideas to you so that you can stay up to date with things going on both in theology, culture, and beyond. Now, as we dive into today's topic, I really want to kind of go through a small library of books for just a second, because as we all know, there has been a massive sort of explosion of debate that's coming about on social media concerning the issue of natural theology and whether or not Christians can do it. Is it a mediating philosophy? Is it something that Christians should turn away from? Is it something that we should embrace? And I think this is a topic that we should discuss. Now, I just got this book in the mail. I have read reviews of this book. I have seen responses to this book, but yet I have not read it. And it is Jeffrey Johnson's book titled The Failure of Natural Theology. And the subtitle is A Critical Appraisal of the Philosophical Theology of... Thomas Aquinas. It's quite a long one there. But what he set out to do in this book is he's trying to critique the natural theology of Thomas Aquinas. And he looks at, is there such a thing as natural theology? How does it differ from general revelation? Can we mix philosophy and theology? Did Aquinas just use Aristotle? I was also looking at his issues with pseudo Dionysus and a whole host of other things here. And I would commend you to at least look at the book to understand the debate that is going on. Now, this is a topic of interest for me. For those of you who are not aware, I spent most of my doctoral work looking at the issues of religious epistemology, specifically from figures like Gordon Clark and Carl F. H. Henry and Cornelius Van Til, and the influence that they had as it relates to philosophy of hermeneutics, metaphysics, philosophy, much more. So this is really a book that is culminating in that sort of stream of thought. Now, I will just be upfront and let you know that I do not agree with all the tenets of that stream of thought. I will come out and let you know that I have not only flirted with the idea, I probably dated with the idea for a time, but I have just through more research, not grown convinced of the full presuppositional paradigm. So I expect to do a lot more on this book going forward, but I would commend you to read it. We need to be aware of the thoughts that are going on. Now, I want to look at a few more books here as we keep going. Now, as anyone who's ever looked at the issues of Thomas Aquinas is aware of the name Norman Geisler. And Dr. Geisler was an ardent Thomist, and he wrote a book titled Thomas Aquinas, an Evangelical Appraisal. And in this book, he was in many ways heading off some of the key issues that figures like Johnson were bringing to the table concerning natural theology and this almost reformed disdain for Aquinas and Aquinas's method of natural theology. 
An interesting thing is, is that several years ago, I went down to Charlotte because for those of you who, who are unaware, Dr. Geisler was a mentor of mine and I was his assistant for a number of years. And I asked him to give about three hours of lecture through this book on the topic of Thomas Aquinas. And I actually have the videos of that. I cannot release them to you, but I can find a way to make them available for you. And one of the things that he sought out to do was to respond to these types of criticisms. Now, I noticed Johnson actually doesn't interact with this book. I was hoping that he would, but he didn't. But the big takeaway that I got from it was Dr. Geisler talked about how R.C. Sproul was also committed to this Thomistic approach. And Sproul used to talk about all of these different things related to why he got a visceral response from those within the Reformed community. And he said, this is how I actually have to engage on the topic. He goes, I present Thomas Aquinas' arguments, but whenever I need a quote, I go to Augustine. So if I'm trying to find something on divine simplicity or immutability or the issue of the impassibility of God, something along those lines, or even the use of philosophical thinking, I go to Augustine because I don't get the visceral response from the Reformed community. They actually listen and sometimes embrace the argument instead of just turning away from it. So I think that there is something to consider with that. Sproul might have been on to something given what we've seen already. Now, just a few more things as we look at it here. I wanted to help explain this whole approach. So about a year ago, I wrote a book titled Defending Evangelicalism, where I tried to summarize this methodical realist or this Aristotelian Thomistic approach put out by Dr. Geisler. And I published a book titled Defending Evangelicalism, The Apologetics of Norman L. Geisler. Now, I agree with pretty much everything I wrote in this book. Geisler and I didn't always agree on everything. We differ on some secondary and third order issues. It never broke our fellowship. We never had heated conversations. We had conversations, but never heated conversations on the matter. But on this matter, we agree. And I wanted to put a summary together. And ironically, a lot of the objections that I'm finding through my initial survey of Johnson's book, we deal with there. I would also commend for you to read Classical Apologetics by Sproul and Gerstner. I actually reread this book just, uh, just recently. And I would commend it to you. I think a lot of the objections, again, that were brought forth are headed off in this book. Now, I want to give you one more example here of this before we dive into the topic of seven essential issues related to metaphysics and the notion of natural theology. I picked up a book several years ago now titled An Absolute Sort of Certainty, The Holy Spirit and the Apologetics of Jonathan Edwards. Now, if anyone is aware of this book, it's put out by Stephen Nichols. He tries to lay out what he considers a reformed epistemology in the works of Jonathan Edwards. And I don't know a single reformed thinker who would not consider Edwards reformed. Second of all, I don't know a single reformed thinker who would argue that Edward somehow denies, diminishes, dilutes this reformed idea that we have the noetic effects of sin and the effects that might have upon our theology and our philosophy and our apologetic. But interestingly enough, you don't find any of the conclusions about those things given by Edwards actually being represented by later reformed thinkers. Let me explain what I mean by that. There has become this almost genuine or general idea within apologetics today by presuppositionalists that unless you are wholeheartedly committed to the transcendental method, you're somehow less than reformed. And I would encourage you to pick up books of this sort to realize that reformed theology is not monopolized by transcendental thinking, nor is it monopolized by presuppositional apologetics. Edwards, in many ways, pulls from empirical epistemologies from his day. He does natural theology. He engages in classical apologetics, offering arguments for the existence of God and really engaging in the topics of his day. And ironically, some people would maybe not consider him reformed in that regard. So I would commend these works to you. Now, as we dive into our topic today, again, I have not read Johnson's book, but I'm very familiar with the issues. 
So I want to provide some help to many people by looking at these issues of natural theology and metaphysics. And to do so, I want us to ask sort of seven essential questions, because I think it'll help us understand what the dialogues and the conversations are all about. And as we look at this, I kind of make it seven essential questions. It could be a hundred essential questions, but I want to deal with seven essential ones as we look at this topic, because I think they're going to give us sort of a bird's eye view or a paradigm to many of the issues. Now, the first question that I want to look at is this, is metaphysics avoidable? Some people will say, well, you just don't need metaphysics. Let's, let's do away with it. Let's have nothing to do with it. So is metaphysics avoidable? And I will give the answer, yes, people avoid metaphysics all the time, or at least they try to avoid metaphysics all the time. The first way they try to do it is they try to avoid it by trying to reduce it to absurdity. They'll throw many of the arguments given from a figure like Hume or Kant or any other key leading thought leader in that regard to say, see, whenever you try to do metaphysics, they just reduce and end in absurdity. So do away with it. Or you're going to find some people that are going to show that certain statements are not necessarily metaphysical. So see, you don't need to do metaphysics if you can just find non-metaphysical propositions or statements. And there are some people who just flat out deny that metaphysics is even a valid discipline. So how might we respond to such a thing? First of all, I think what we need to look at is this. There are many more metaphysicians in this world than actually physicians. Because everyone to some degree does metaphysics and not everyone does physics. You can't avoid doing metaphysics. Metaphysics is a feature of the world that we live in because it's the world that God has made. People may say they are not doing philosophy, but ironically, that's a philosophy in itself. And we find this all the time when people try to say, I don't need logical thinking. You do logical thinking. I don't need logical thinking. Well, let me get this straight. Are you, or are you not doing logical thinking? It seems like they're using the law of non-contradiction when they don't want to use the law of non-contradiction. Well, that's a metaphysical statement. It's a logical statement built off of and grounded and rooted in the concepts of metaphysics, as would be the principle of identity, law of non-contradiction, the law of excluded middle, the law of causality. So let me give you a few examples here. All people who offer indicative statements are doing metaphysics. So all people who are actually trying to say something in a meaningful way are engaging in the topic of metaphysics, whether they like it or not. For example, any assertion that something is, which is an existential judgment, or that something is what it is, a copulative judgment about what it is. So you're saying this is the case, or you're saying this is this particular thing. A dog exists. Well, what exists? A dog exists. So that it actually exists and you're defining something about it. You're doing metaphysics. Why? Because you're talking about the essence and the existence of the thing. What it is and how it exists. Now, a person cannot avoid doing metaphysics. It's part and parcel of living in this world. And the reason you can't avoid it is for the same kind of reasons that you can't avoid the topic of ethics. To deny ethics is an ethical choice, and to deny metaphysics is a metaphysical choice. The denial or disregard of metaphysics is a statement about reality and relations in reality and how reason functions in reality, which are all metaphysical claims. You can't get away from this metaphysical universe because the second you say, I deny metaphysics, you're giving a predication about reality, which is a metaphysical statement. If you try to dilute metaphysics, if you try to get around metaphysics, you're going to make metaphysical claims. So like it or not, you're doing metaphysics. Now, let me give you an example of how this might apply. This is an example from the topic of abortion. Now we know the issue of abortion is metaphysical and it's ethical. If universal essences such as human nature are in fact real, which is a metaphysical question, and if all human beings possess this essence, and if human knowledge can know universals such as human nature, 
And if there are universal moral rights possessed by human beings based upon universal human nature, then the right to life must be defended on these rights, and abortion violates the rights of another human being. The point is this. If you're going to say that it's a human being and you can know that it's a human being, then it carries the ethical responsibility of actually being a human being. If you cannot grasp these kinds of things, if you cannot know that metaphysics is real or you're denying it, you're losing your metaphysical basis to make ethical claims about the topic of abortion. Now, let's turn this to another issue. Abortion continues along the metaphysical lines when it talks about the notion of actuality and potentiality. You know, you'll hear people say, well, it's not really human life. It's just a clump of cells. And we say, no, it's, it's human life with the potential for greater human activities such as rational thought. And we get into this debate about, is it really a human? Is it not a human? Well, those are metaphysical claims and the potential activities that can come from it are also metaphysical claims. So if all individual human beings possess universal human nature, they also possess, as soon as they possess human nature, a real potentiality to exercise future distinctively human acts, such as reasoning, even if they are unable to at that exact moment. This assumption of real potentialities, like the assumption of real essences, is also a metaphysical question. If there are no real universal natures or potentialities, then we do not have the capacity to know them or make judgments, nor do we have the moral obligation to recognize them. So all of the people who are engaging in this issue of metaphysics and potential life and actual life and the, and the debate on abortion and pro-life causes, you are engaging in the topic of metaphysics, whether you like it or not. The question is whether or not you're using a good metaphysic to actually engage on the issues. The second question that I want to look at today is, are universals real? Some people say, no, we only have individuals. If you have two dogs outside named Wrigley and Bailey, there's not a third dog called Dogness or the nature of dogs. And I remember one time sitting in a class and this professor said, you don't have human nature. Look, when you read the Bible, you just have men and women. You have Adam and Eve and you have these figures. You don't have this human nature. And in many ways, what he's doing is, is he's affirming this idea known as nominalism, which denies that there are universals or that there are real natures in things. Now, what we have to find here is, is that universals, essences, or universals, natures are only potential, they'll say, and not actual. So we can do away with them. There's no actual real natures. They're just these potentials that may come into fruition. And they'll give this example of, well, unicorns and horses are both universals, but only one actually exists. A third objection that they bring is that common sense only recognizes individuals. No one ever tries to find dogness or redness. When you go outside and you're looking for your dog that's loose, you never go out and look for the essence of dogness. You're looking for your particular dog. So how might we respond to this issue? Well, first of all, nominalism, which is the view that denies universals, is self-contradictory. For the position itself is a universal, and it offers universal statements, namely the statement, all universals are unreal, that they apply universally. They use a universal language as a means to communicate there are no universals. So the interesting thing is, is that in their very act of doing philosophy, they're presupposing metaphysical realism in their denial of universals because they're using universals in the writings of the books and in the philosophy that they're actually trying to deny, namely realism. For example, universals are required for knowledge to have an object. Knowledge is not just about meeting certain conditions. You actually know a thing, but if there are no things to know, no universals to grasp, the intellect is left grasping for an object. Now, intellectual knowledge differs from sensual knowledge. Our senses are always viewing changing particulars, such as redness. The intellect views unchanging universals, such as the idea of a rose. So let me clarify what I mean here. 
what we find is that when we look at the real world, we find that things are presented to our senses, but yet they go beyond the senses. The mind can grasp real natures. We don't only see dogs and the colors and the shapes and the movements. We actually have this idea of dogness itself. The senses can abstract these forms, they can grasp these forms, but they don't lie directly within the senses themselves. The mind is unique in that it can grasp universals. In fact, the difference of man and the difference it makes is that humanity is able to rationally grasp and abstract these universals. And that's what makes the difference between the brute and the human being. There's a difference of kind, not of degree. Now, a difference of degree would be something like a small circle versus a large circle. And as you make that circle larger, we find that they can only differ by degree. There's no difference of kind between them. And in, in a sense, the circle, the smaller one, could become as large as the bigger one. Now, a difference of kind would be the difference between a circle and a square. You can start adding more lines and sides to the square, and it might approach a circle, but it never actually becomes a circle. Why? There's a difference of kind. And in a similar fashion, you might find animals doing a variety of things. And while they may get close to the essence of humanity, they never actually arrive. Why? Because there's a difference of kind between the different beings. Humanity has rational thought. We're made in the image of God. We're thinking things. So we don't just have sensual knowledge. We have universal knowledge. And as we look at this, Values require universals. If you're going to make any kind of ethical claim or any kind of value claim, it requires universals. Now, if universals do not exist, then universal values do not exist. Human values have to be more than changing human particular experiences, unless we want our moral values to be subjective and changing. If we live in a world where everything is changing, then there are no ethical absolutes. We're bound to that situation and there are no binding ethical things that we can bring about in life. But none of us live that way. We live in a world where ethical realities and ethical universals are made apparent. Just as we live in a world where rational and logical universals are made apparent. We can't deny them because we live in God's world. And because we live in God's world, we respond to God's world in the way that God would intend us to respond. So if somebody robs you, you're getting angry because it's a breaking of the law of God and the justice of God. So here's the metaphysical reality that we find ourselves in. You have some people that are going to say all particular realities change. Heraclitus. You'll have others that are going to say universal natures of being cannot change. Parmenides. Therefore, universal nature of being transcends particulars. Plato. So let's explain this. Heraclitus is saying everything's changing in the sense particulars, so there's no stability. Parmenides responds and says, no, universals don't change, but he can't account for particulars. The world that we live in can't seem to grasp these particulars. They seem to be beyond that. So that's why Plato postulated his whole world of forms. Namely, they transcend the particulars. We can't deny them. We can't deny their unity or that they exist. We just can't put them here. So let's go one step further. To affirm universals are real does not rationally entail platonic realism, where they are separately real or existing substances. Aristotle taught that universals such as dogness are real only in dogs and in the minds of those who know dogs. Namely, universals are not real substances, but the real forms of individual substances, and that they are real as separate abstract universals only in the human minds that abstract them. So let me break that down. What you're going to find is this, is Aristotle differs from Plato and that Plato put these forms in an extra world. They are existing substances that have their own existence in and of themselves. But Aristotle said, no, we think that the forms are here in this world and that when you know them, you look at two dogs or a dog and you abstract that form and it can exist in the mind. So universals exist in the mind of the person. They exist in particular things. 
But how did they get there in the first place? Well, they may be divine ideas. That's the, the Christian influence that was given to them. Universals exist as divine ideas. And this form of metaphysics given where they're in things, they can be extracted into the mind, is known as a form of moderate realism. And the idea that they are real substances in another almost world is known as extreme realism or platonic realism. And what Aquinas and other figures tried to do is they tried to embrace Aristotelian moderate realism. But here's what I want you to see. This whole issue of forms and reality and metaphysics is something that Christians have been engaging with for roughly 2,000 years now. And what we have to find is, is that all realists, both Christian and non-Christian, but the Christians in particular, affirm a real world of forms. It's not as though one is denying forms and one is somehow embracing them and we're, we're left in this, this quagmire mire during this time. Rather, what they're doing is, is that they're giving them a new postal address. What we find is, is that Aristotle was right in that he put them in things. Plato was right in that he said, well, they're not fully in things. They have some kind of existence elsewhere. But the Christians came along and said, well, we'll give them another address. They find their absolute grounding in the mind of God. And in the act of creation, God puts them in particular things. That's the real way that we can understand the issue of the one and the many. That's the real foundation for the classic explanation for the one and the many. So in summary, all people affirm this world of forms if they're within this broader Christian, scholastic, realist tradition. The only difference is sometimes they give them a new postal address. Now, what we have to find here is, is that there can be responses to some of these claims. Dogness is not a third dog, but it is the nature of the two dogs. It's what they have in common. If there were not dogness, we could not truthfully and honestly call Wrigley and Bailey two dogs. The, the language, the proposition, the statement would be utterly meaningless. In addition, the nature of a unicorn only has potential existence because unicorns do not actually exist. However, the nature of a horse is actual because horses actually exist. Sometimes universals are what they say is existentially neutral, meaning they can both potentially and actually exist. They are not locked into just one. They have the ability to both exist like in a, in a unicorn, but they also have the ability to exist like a horse. Their existence is just different. One is potential existence. Another one is actual existence. But what we also find here is, is that common sense and the common man use common nouns like dogs all the time in our common speech, as well as proper nouns, Wrigley and Bailey. We jump in and out of these sentences every time that we try to interact with a person. Can you hand me the banana? Can you hand me an apple? Can you fix my car? And each time that we're doing this, we're talking about particular things, but yet we're also talking about common nouns, cars, dogs, apples, fruits, bananas, and so forth. We live in a world where we assume metaphysical realness and the reality of universals. The only way to get around it is, is that you sometimes have to be taught to embrace them. Sometimes the academic man is outwitting himself and turning away from the common sense of the common man. When the reality is, is that common speech proves that the common man is commonly correct. The third thing, what about this issue of the one and the many? How do we interact with that question or the question of what about the one and the many? How do universals and particulars react and relate to one another? So how do universals and particulars relate in this world. One person says, well, oneness is not real. For the existing things are many, and it is impossible to be both one and many. Another person says, manyness is not real because being is one, and based upon the law of non-contradiction, it cannot be both one and many at the same time, 
and the same sense. So one person is emphasizing the oneness, another person is emphasizing the manyness. And a third person might come back and say, oneness is not real because the universe is the sum total of many existing things, not a third existing thing. The universe is one unity, not a many third thing. Now, as we look at this, common sense has always affirmed per our use of language, the reality of both a one and a many. We use common and proper nouns, and we also use singular and plural speech. The point is, is that when we're speaking and engaging and looking at different topics, we use both one and many language in our very propositions and in the way that we think. We use proper nouns. We talk about individual things. We use, in many respects, we talk about particular subjects. We use plurals. We use singulars. Why? Because we expect our language to actually reflect the way that reality functions. Also, experience shows that both the person who affirms oneness and manyness are correct. Have you noticed this? There's one person who's overemphasizing oneness and another person who's overemphasizing the manyness to the exclusion of the other. But what reality and what experience shows is that both of them are correct. So what we need to do is find a philosophy of nature that actually accounts for both of them. And what we find is, is that both are correct, like we've said time and time again, evidence in normal dialogue, rational thought, and the daily affairs in the marketplace. So the burden of proof rests on the one who denies either the one or the many or both, if that's somehow possible. The individual would actually have to give an account for why all of the oneness doesn't function or why all of the manyness doesn't function. Our burden of proof is that we need to engage that person, but we've already given explanations for them. So let's keep going here. Let's maybe give an explanation for it. Oneness and manyness can coexist because oneness and manyness can exist in different respects or senses. Many different things can exist, the same species, and possess the same or one essential form. Let me just keep explaining this here. Bear with me. Keep going. Being can be both one and many in different respects. A contradiction is affirming A and non-A at the same time in the same sense. Two opposites can be affirmed as long as it isn't a contradiction. So let me give you an example here. We can talk about human nature both as a one, as a unity, but yet we can also talk about it in this idea of a plurality. And I give this example here. You can talk about a human being both in the idea that you are a particular human being. You are John. You can talk about human nature, which has a unity to it, but you can also talk about it as a mini in the sense that it has a soul and a body. You can also talk about this idea of the oneness and the manyness in humanity in a variety of other ways. A human being is both visible and invisible. You have a body that's visible and a soul that is invisible. You can talk about humanity being both good and evil. You're good metaphysically, ontologically, as you exist, but you're also evil morally. Do we see how the, the one and the many can come together in very particular situations? And based off of this, we can see that oneness and manyness can exist, and they do sometimes exist in a variety of ways together. Now, again, a contradiction would be to say that the soul is visible and invisible at the same time in the same sense, or that you're both good and evil at the same time in the same sense. But that's not what we're affirming. We're making a distinction between them. The term universe implies both unity and diversity. We've seen that. We've seen this objection. However, there are other existing beings that are composed without implying some third thing. This idea that when you look at the universe... If you put it all together, you've got the particulars and you've got the unity. But if you're going to have a universal essence of them, you're going to have some third thing that you're appealing to. Namely, we find humans are both a soul and a body and their unity is not a third thing. It's found in themselves, in the thing itself. It's not like there's this fancy word, the tertium quid, a third thing outside of it. 
But fundamentally, the premise of the entire argument is flawed. There are there does exist something beyond the sum total of the universe, namely God. So you've got a unity. It's a true unity, but it's not self-sufficient in and of itself. There's a God beyond it. So our next question is this, and this is probably going to dive into the topic a little bit more. Is natural theology possible? Some will say no, because God is infinite and you cannot define an infinite being. Our finite terms never actually describe an infinite being. Or no, because logic does not apply to God, because that would limit God. Or no, because God is the object of faith, not reason. Or because God is the object of religion, not philosophical science. Or because human reason is too weak and wrecked by sin. Or God cannot be proven because we cannot prove something unless it is known with certainty. So let's look at this. First of all, is natural theology possible? We all desire that which we know, and we do not desire that which we do not know. If you are unaware of something, you're not desiring it. Why? Because you're not even aware of the concept. We, we find this in day-to-day -day life all the time. If I'm unaware that there is a brand new computer out there or that there's a new iPhone that's out there or whatever gadget, device, food that you want, if you're unaware of it, you're not necessarily desiring it. But if you know that it's there, it changes everything. Why? Because we desire that which we know. Now, what we find is, is that God is an object of desire, either good desire or bad desires. We either seek God or we hate God. Now, I understand when, when the text says no one seeks God, no, not one. But what we also find is, is that the heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. Those statements need not be taken in absolute senses. There is a sense in which nobody is seeking God, but yet there is a sense in which everybody realizes that they need something beyond themselves. There is a seeking for God in that regard. However, if we desire God, we must know God. Just like if we're desiring the new iPhone, we somehow know about the iPhone. Therefore, God is not altogether unknowable by natural reason where we wouldn't have any desire. There wouldn't be any longing for that which is going to bring rest to the restless heart. So insofar as anything is knowable by reason, it can be rational. And it can be a rational science, whether it's physical, philosophical, or mathematical. So the onus of proof really goes upon the person on whether or not an individual has this desire. And if they have that desire, how can you not rationally know something and yet desire it. It seems like a more coherent explanation would be is that you desire that which you know. And the reason that people have a desire for God or they have an interaction, this, this heart is restless for thee, is because they in some way, shape, or form know God. Now, I don't think that people who are really buying into the, the presuppositional approach or this idea of self-evident knowledge would deny that we have these desires and these knowledges. It's how we get them. So at this point, we're all in agreement. We know that there is a God. It's how we come to know that there is a God is where the debate really starts to find its footing within the evangelical world. Now let's continue looking at this. Now, God can be defined in a variety of ways. And some people are going to say, well, you can't seek for God and you can't know God with a natural theology because you're using negative terms, infinite, that negative term. Well, one way God can be defined is negatively as the non-finite, non-temporal, non-changing, non-caused, non-potential being. This clearly distinguishes God from all other types of finite, temporal, changing, caused, and potential beings. We see that there are are a variety of ways that you can actually name God. And what we're starting out by saying is, is all the things that you see here in the sense world, God's not any of those. He's not that finite thing. He's not that changing thing. He's above and beyond that. Now, there are other ways that we can actually name God by finding analogy of perfections in God, where we can talk about the nature of God in that sense. But this is just one way. So if a person's going to say natural theology is useless because we can't use negative language, well, that's one of many ways. But even that negative language gives us true knowledge of what God is not. 
It's a via negativa approach. Now, in addition to this, we find logic and logical sentences apply to God and all senses that deny logic and sentences apply to God. The very use of language requires we use logic. Even if our language denies logic applies to God. So let me explain what I mean by this. If somebody's going to talk about God, they're going to use language and sentences to describe it. But if somebody's going to deny God and say, well, logic can't get to it, you're using logical language and logical sentences applied to God in a way to say that logic and sentences cannot apply to God. You cannot have it both ways. But some people are going to say, God cannot be both an object of faith and reason. But we would deny that. And we're going to say, God can be both an object of faith and reason. Just like one truth can be an object for both physics and mathematics. There are truths that go beyond reason, but there are no truths that oppose or go against reason. If a truth goes beyond reason, it is not scientifically just demonstrable, like the Trinity or the Incarnation. However, reason can refute objections and provide analogies. In short, if reason can understand an object, then it can prove some truths about God and guarantee a science of natural theology. So just because God can be known in a variety of ways doesn't mean that a different way of knowing God is somehow invalid or doesn't work. Rather, it's just saying that there are proverbially more than one way to skin a cat or there's proverbially more than one way you can know an object. I can know an object through physical quantitative study. I can know something through abstract study. I can know an object in a variety of ways. But yet God is much more beyond even those physical things. So if there are a variety of ways of knowing particular created objects, why would we deny such a thing about a being who is above all of creation and say that he's going to somehow be known in one simplistic, easy, less rational fashion? God is known both by faith and by reason. And when we know God by reason, we really know him in a true, meaningful way. Now, some people are going to go so far and they'll, they'll say this. We can say, if someone is going to say we cannot have a natural theology because humanity suppresses the truth, it would be incoherent to suppress a truth that cannot be known or is not known. My point in this is, is that in order to suppress a truth, you have to know the truth. But what we're arguing is, is that a person knows that God exists from creation. We know that there is a creator, but... In order to deny the creator, we have to actually know that there's a creator. We don't deny that which we don't know. The fact that someone is suppressing the knowledge of God indicates that knowledge of God is present. The knowledge remains present because the sinner is unsuccessful in fully suppressing the knowledge of God. Now, they, they do suppress that knowledge, and they do start to do vain, idle things with that knowledge. No clear, historic, reformed Protestant would ever say anything to the contrary. But here's the point. The issue is that human beings have the knowledge of God and they distort it. They distort it because they hate it. Just because someone can abuse a science doesn't disprove the science. And just because somebody can abuse the knowledge of God doesn't deny that they actually have knowledge of God. Now, let me give you an example. There are going to be some people are going to say, well, this can't be affirmed anywhere within the historic reform tradition. And in the book, Classical Apologetics, John Gerstner actually responds to this. And he looks at Calvin and a variety of other figures, but he looks most importantly to Jonathan Edwards. And Gerstner, who we know both believed in total depravity, and Edwards, who believed in total depravity, went on to say this about Edwards' views. Reason must prove the existence of God the Revealer. So they're actually believing that reason can prove the existence of God, which is a form of natural theology, and that reason anticipates this revelation, this general revelation. And I know there's a lot of talk about denying that general and revelation and natural theology have anything in common. I think that one would be hard-pressed to find that in the great literature of the reformers and the scholastic reformers. So we're going to use them in many ways joined together. He would also go on to say reason must grasp the message of revelation. Reason must demonstrate the rationality of revelation. Reason must verify the supernaturalness of revelation. Reason argues 
the dependability of revelation. Reason defends the mysteries of revelation. Reason must interpret the contents of revelation. The point is this. Gerstner goes on to say that there are actually limits to reason. Reason cannot make the knowledge of God real to unregenerate. Reason cannot yield a supernatural salvific revelation. Reason cannot determine all that revelation may reveal. Reason cannot apprehend revelation as revelation. And he goes on to conclude this. We suggest that classic Reformed orthodoxy saw that the noetic influence of sin, not as direct through a totally depraved mind, but as indirect through the totally depraved heart. If the mind is obliterated in the sense that it can no longer think, both Sproul and Gerstner say that's actually a form of hyper Calvinism, not actually classic Calvinism. Now, I don't want to get into debates over the, the terms in that regard, but the point is, is that classic Calvinism has always affirmed that there is an image of God in people, but that has been twisted and distorted, not completely erased. It's wrong and incorrect to say that the classic reform position denies the image of God. Rather, it's an extreme form of it that denies it. But the point that we find here is, is that the bigger issue is, is that the reason that the mind is distorting it is, one, it has to know that which is distorting, but the heart, the moral problem, is causing it to distort it. It hates that God, and it's twisting and distorting that God. There's a great intricacy and the key relationship between the head and the heart, according to Sproul and Gerstner. And what they would say is the classic reform position. Just go look at the book themselves. I'm trying to use their terminology and their categories because I think it represents the classic view on the matter. Now, what we have to find is, is that when we're discussing the possibility of natural theology, logic actually allows for proofs that prove. Deductive logic necessarily entails a conclusive or certain conclusion. There are some people that are going to say, well... We offer these proofs for God, but they're not certain. In other words, they're saying we want a proof that doesn't actually prove. But that's not how logic functions. People can't do away with the classical position by saying, well, it doesn't rise to the level of certainty. Well, certain people, particular people, don't take it to that. But the classic view is, no, logic and rational proofs actually prove. So if there is a natural theology and a logic of natural theology concerning arguments for the existence of God, then we can have proofs that actually prove the existence of God. Moral certainty is not a substitute for epistemological certainty. We are, in many ways, able to both epistemologically and morally be certain that God exists. The fifth question, is the God of natural theology the God of the Bible? So we ask that question, is the God of natural theology the God of the Bible? Many would say no. They will say no, the God of the Bible differs from the God of the philosophers. No, because the God of the philosophers is a static, abstract Greek view of God, whereas the God of the Bible is relational and personal. Or no, because the God of the Bible is more than an uncaused, unmoved being. So as we look at this, first of all, we need to say it's at least rationally possible to have a minimal definition of God or any type of metaphysical object. It's at least rationally possible for everybody to have a definition of whatever this God may be, we can actually standardize it. We can look it up. We can fit a dictionary definition on the matter. And from a standard definition of any object, including God, we also realize many attributes can be deduced. So whether we're talking about God as a metaphysical attribute, or whether or not we're talking about, say, humanity as a metaphysical property and attribute, we can define it. Humanity is a rational animal, and based off of that definition, we can make many deductions about it. But why could we not do the same about God? What's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. Now, We've had many definitions for God. We know that Aquinas would get to the ends of his proofs and say, and by this term, we all know to be God. But let's take another one. Let's take one that 
people are more used to hearing. We'll take Anselm's approach. For example, if we grant Anselm's definition of God, that than which nothing greater can be conceived, namely this perfect being theology, even though the argument may have weaknesses, we find that many attributes can be deduced. If God is perfect, then as Anselm and many others would say, he must be actual because it's better to exist as an actual being than just a potential being to be an eternal being, spiritual, all-powerful, all-knowing, good, just, and wise, than to merely be potential, temporal, physical, limited in power, limited knowledge, evil, unjust, and not wise, and evil again. You get my point? If God is a perfect being, or something that which nothing greater can be conceived, we have a standard definition, and we can make many definitions and discuss many attributes about that God or about that being. Now, what we have to find is this. There are many attributes that only describe God and can only describe God and not creatures. Namely, we'll give you two. The idea that God is a necessary being. If God is a necessary being, there cannot be two necessary beings for they would have to differ in some regard. And if there's this difference between them, well, Where did they both come from? You can't have two necessary beings or one of pure actuality. If there are two beings with pure actuality, they would have to differ, which means at least one has some kind of difference than the other, and that difference would be a potentiality. It would be something that one might grasp for. Maybe one has a greater perfection than the other, which means he's not pure act. He would be longing for that extra aspect or that actual being to be in him. But what we also find is is that different arguments for a similar conclusion, do not entail different conclusions. These different approaches do not prove different gods, but different attributes of God in different ways human beings can know God. If two definitions contradict one another, at least one is false. But there is no rational contradiction between Christian natural theology and biblical theology. They may differ in the way that they go about things. One might say more than the other, but they don't actually contradict one another. For example, God may be more than an eternal, uncaused, unmoved mover. However, God, in order to fulfill the godness of God, cannot be anything less than an eternal, uncaused, unmoved mover. The Bible may give us more information about the nature of God obtained from natural theology, but it does not give us information that contradicts the God of classical theism arrived at by natural theology. Just because there are differences within a science does not disprove the validity of the science. Rather, it shows that there are true and false ways of approaching a science. The reason people reject the conclusions of proper natural theology is because they hate the God of the conclusion which entails they have a knowledge of the God they are rejecting. But ultimately and finally, if you're going to disregard this as saying one is the biblical God and one is the Greek God, I would say, well, pick your Greek approach to ultimate reality. Those who don't like an uncaused, eternal, infinite, immutable being, well, how about your temporal, changing, mutable being? You say that it's Greek and call it maybe Parmenides or Aristotelian. Well, yours is following Heraclitus, namely your ultimate realities in flux. The knife can cut both ways. If you're going to disregard my view of God based upon it's just the God of the Greek philosophers, well, the Greek philosophers also had views that match that view of God, maybe your view of God. So which one is it? If you don't like the Greeks, well, be consistent. But if you're going to try to match Greeks versus Greeks and say one's more biblical than the other, welcome to the task of natural theology. Now, here's another question that's become very, very uh, prominent. Is God's existence self-evident? Now, this is an interesting question. We must look at it in a variety of ways. God is self-evident because of what the term God means, they might say. This is the classic ontological proof. Once the intellect understands what the name God means and what it means to exist, the mind immediately sees that God must exist. It's a self-evident 
terminological way that God exists. Because by the name God is meant a supreme being, and a supreme being cannot just exist in the intellect alone. For a greater being is one that exists in the intellect and in reality. Thus, the proposition God exists is self-evident, and his existence cannot be demonstrated. For that which is self-evident is something that's not demonstrated. For example, we say that the laws of logic are self-evident. How do I prove the law of non-contradiction? Well, I can't prove it. I can merely just use it. Or how do I prove the law of identity? Well, I can't prove the law of identity. Rather, I use the law of identity to prove other things. And in that sense, God is self-evident. By understanding the terms, you understand what's being claimed. Just like 2 plus 2 equals 4, when you understand what the concept of 4 means and what the concept of 2 and plus and 2 and an equal sign means. Now, there are a few things to think about this. First of all, there is a distinction between self-evident in itself and something different to claim that it is self-evident to us. They are not the same. In itself, God's existence is self-evident and that God in himself and of himself is perfect actuality since that which is God is his own to be. God's being is his essence. God is self-evident in and of himself. But that which is God, that is, God himself, cannot be conceived by our mind in a self-evident way. And so God remains unknown to us. We have finite concepts, but God is infinite. We may have finite concepts about an infinite God, but we don't have the infinity placed into us. We don't have all of God in our minds. We have segments that God has revealed to us. They can be true segments. We A finite truth, and to know a finite truth is to know actual truth. You can know that there is a canary in the wall without knowing the wall and all. That's because a finite truth can be a true truth. And the point that we have to see here is, is that the mode of man's knowledge is the reason God's existence is not self-evident to us. God is an infinite being and we are finite beings. All our knowledge is always finite. Hence, we always have a partial or not self-evident knowledge of God. There's always something about the concept of God that we get. And there's also a part that we're not able to grasp. Here's another issue. Anselm's argument falls prey to a fallacy of equivocation, namely using the same term in two different ways. It begins with the concept of God and concludes with the proposition God exists. The argument goes from concept of God to the actuality of God. However, the term God is used in two different ways. In the first instance, God is used as a concept. In a second sense, it is predicated of reality. In short, the term God is the conclusion doesn't match the term God in the premises. One's used conceptually and one's used actually. They're used in two different ways. If it's going to be in the conclusion, it has to be in the premises. Now, there's even more to this as we start to flesh this out. Whenever natural theology seeks to treat its object, it is trying to explain the formal object of its scientific inquiry. Within special revelation or sacred theology, God reveals himself to us through the text of scripture. But in natural science or natural theology, God cannot be the proper subject matter since something that is directly given in nature or coming directly from nature is to be investigated and known. And because God is not a being whose nature can be directly identified with nature, since God's nature is incompatible with the attributes or properties of created being, God is not directly offered to our intellect as an object of understanding about which we can make predicates, premises, and reason unto conclusions. The point is this, is that we know reality. And we know reality in a direct way. But the features and attributes and characteristics of reality differ from the attributes of God. God is different from creation. God is the creator. He is not the creation. And we're not going to identify that which is self-evidently known in nature with the nature of God. Rather, what we do is given the natural order of being and our mode of 
existence, namely we're finite beings who know in a rational way things coming from creation, the term God is offered to our intellect as something that must be demonstrated through reason. God's nature is not offered to our intellect directly, but indirectly. The term God is something given mediately, not immediately, not in and of himself, but through his creatures. God is not the principal subject, but only the principal cause of the subject. Therefore, natural theology attempts to treat God's existence and nature insofar as these can be known from an understanding of created being according to their mode of understanding. In other words, natural theology proceeds to knowledge of God from effects to cause, from a posteriori reasoning, because knowledge of the sensible is prior to our knowledge of God, whose nature is suprasensible. The existence of an effect necessarily and immediately depends upon its proper cause. Therefore, given the existence of an effect, rationally, the existence of its proper cause necessarily and immediately follows. According to Aristotle and Aquinas, sensible or material things are immediately known to us, and our knowledge of them is prior to our knowledge of God. Thus, if these material existent things can be shown to be effects, to be creatures, they can legitimately be used to demonstrate the existence of God. They have properties or characteristics of effects, of things that are produced, of things that receive their being. But because all effects pre-exist in their cause, these perfects must be found in greater degree in the cause. And these beings must be necessarily and immediately dependent upon this being as their proper cause. Now, one of the key things that people try to bring about it is, is they're trying to say, how do we deal with Thomas Aquinas and how he somehow gives up self-evident knowledge? Well, he does in many ways give up self-evident knowledge, but why? And let's look at one of his arguments. The objection brought against Aquinas is this. Aquinas writes, there's also the consideration that through which all the rest are known ought itself to be self-evident. So namely... God is of this sort. For just as the light of the sun is the principle of all intelligible knowledge, since the divine light is that which intelligible illumination is found first in its highest degree, that God exists, therefore, must be self-evident. And Aquinas resp responds to this and says, So too, with the fifth argument, an easy solution is available. For God is indeed that by which all things are known. Not in the sense that they are not known unless he is known, as obtaining among self-evident principles, but because all our knowledge is caused in and through his influence. So let me summarize all of what's just been said here. In short, the only reason you have knowledge is because God willed and caused it to be. You don't have to presuppose the knowledge of God to know other things. Because as he said, for God is indeed that by which all things are. They are known, not in the sense that they are not known unless he is known, but because all our knowledge is caused in us through his influence. God is causing you to know the world from effect to cause reasoning, and that is still God working in you to know things. It's not pure autonomy. Rather, it's God creating the world in such a fashion that you operate as creatures in God's creation by knowing things the way that he fashioned and in his lordship determined for you to know them. So here's our final question as we wrap this up. The final question is, can God's existence and attributes be proven? In short, yes. Whenever a human artist chooses to paint a picture, we may rationally and validly infer some things about the artist from the art. The same is true about the cosmos, the greatest work of art. Observed facts in every arena of life require an explanation. If we experience motion, causal dependence, the contingency of finite beings, degrees of perfection, and beings working towards an end, there is an explanation. So what I want to do is I want to explain what I mean by this. And I actually want to give the, the Thomistic argument, the one presented by Dr. Geisler, to explain how we can actually prove the existence and attributes of God. Because I think many people hear it, but sometimes they don't always see it. So sit back, wait right there. We're going to go through this in several steps. First of all, being is. Being is being. Being is not being. 
either being or non-being. Non-being cannot produce being, and being causes being similar to itself. These are, in other words, the foundations, the first principles upon which all knowledge and reality exist. The principle of identity, law of non-contradiction, law of excluded middle, law of causality, or the principle of analogy. Laws and principles can be used in similar fashions in this regard. So if things exist, have identity, can't be the exact same, have an excluded middle, Every effect has a cause. You can't give that which you don't have. And there's a principle of analogy. You produce beings similar to yourself. If we have these things, what does that do to us and our arguments for the existence of God? Can we actually pull it off? Many say no. Geisler, Aquinas, and Scholastic Reformers, and Edwards, and Warfield, and Gerstner, and Sproul all say yes. So here's what it might look like. A being can either be a being can be either necessary or contingent, but not both. This is based on the principle of excluded middle. You cannot be both a contingent and necessary being. If you're a contingent being, by definition, you're not a necessary being. If you're a necessary being, by definition, you're not a contingent being. However, a necessary being cannot produce another necessary being. The opposite of this is reducible to a contradiction because... A, a necessary being by its nature cannot come to be or cease to be. And B, the being that is caused by a necessary being comes to be, which is contradictory. Nine, a contingent being cannot cause another contingent being in the ultimate sense of the term. That's how it should be understood. This is because a contingent being is one that could not be, could be nothing. And if it caused another being, then a non-being would be produced Seeing being, which is contradictory in the ultimate sense of cause. A necessary being is being of pure actuality with no potentiality. Since there, This is so since a necessary being has no potentiality to not exist. If a necessary being exists, then it must exist necessarily with no possibility not to exist. 11. A being of pure actuality cannot produce another being with pure actuality. The being that is produced by a being of pure actuality must have both actuality and potentiality, for this created being has the potential not to be, with pure actuality does not have. 12. Every being caused by a being of pure actuality must be both like and unlike its cause. It must be like its cause in its actuality, and it must be unlike its cause in its potentiality. And what is both like and unlike its cause is similar or analogous to it. 13. I am a contingent being. This is since I undeniably exist, and I am neither a necessary being nor an impossible being. I am not an impossible being since I do actually exist, and I am not a necessary being because I change or come to be, which a necessary being cannot do. Hence, I am a contingent being. But only a necessary being can cause a contingent being. Even a pantheist who claims to be identical to God admits that he, he or she came to be in a state of enlightenment, and thus not always was in it. 14. Therefore, a necessary being of pure actuality exists that causes me to exist. In the moment, right here and now. Not just in the past, right here and now. And based upon this, Geisler, following Aquinas, even following the old Augustinian concept, this necessary being is a being of pure actuality with no potentiality and a certain necessary attributes. One, immutable, since it has no potential to change. Eternal, since that involves change. Immaterial, since that involves change. Infinite, since it has no potentiality to limit it. Simple, since it has no potential to be divided. It must be uncaused being, since it is a necessary being. And a necessary being cannot be caused to come to be. So it can't be caused, nor can it be self-caused, which is a contradiction. Hence, it must be an uncaused being. It must be only one being, since there can't be two or more infinite beings or two or more beings of pure actuality. There is no way they could differ in their being, for they are both the same kind of being, and beings cannot differ in the very respect in which they are the same. It must be infinitely knowing, omniscient, since I am a knowing being that it caused to exist, and a cause cannot give what it does not have. 
It must be omnipotent, since it's infinite and it has the power to cause finite beings to exist. It must be morally perfect. Why? Because it causes morally perf- or moral beings to exist, and it cannot share with it what it does not have. It must be a personal being, since it made personal beings, and the effect is similar to its efficient cause. The point is this. This infinite, eternal, morally perfect, omniscient, omnipotent, immutable, uncaused being is the cause of all finite beings. And that is what we all mean by the term God. So can we prove the existence and attributes of God? Yes. How? Based off of self-evident first principles. So the point that I want you to see on this is we are going to spend more time breaking this down, looking at the specifics of Johnson's arguments and maybe other figures. But I wanted to lay out some clear basic guidelines of what do we mean. So in summary, what I want you to know is this. Metaphysics is a science that can be done. Natural theology is possible. Christians have done it for centuries. The Reformed tradition has carried it on. The non-Reformed tradition has carried it on. And if they're going to, in many ways, criticize us for embracing the classical realist tradition and use that as some kind of argument to do away with what we're doing, well, what about their embrace of modernity? In particular, things coming from figures like Kant and other individuals that are denying that we can have a posteriori reasoning. Now, if they don't like those types of claims because they say, well, we're not doing exactly what they're doing. Well, neither was Aquinas doing exactly what Aristotle was doing. And neither was Augustine doing exactly what Plato was doing. Rather, they took these features of reality and by God's grace and providence, used them to fulfill the apologetic task. And that's exactly what I would encourage you to do. So again, before we leave, I just ask, help me do a few things here. Please like and subscribe if you like what you've seen here. We're going to add more to it. Leave your comments about questions or changes you'd like to see going forward. Again, this is another episode of Timeless Dialogues. I'm your host, Bill Roach, and this episode went out before all the planes of this wonderful land.